pretty soon. I'm just mm -hmm. going to um, say, well, it's Richard Jackson coming at you from Boston College, and um, Boston College is hosting this uh, event today, but it's, uh, it's an include event, and uh, it's organized by the, one of the include subcommittees on professional development and learning that uh, Betsy Dalton organizes. Uh, Linda Planton from Sweden and Tracy Galvin from Northern Ireland and uh, myself, we are um, kind of the committee that uh, meets to convene uh, these sessions. Uh, we hope that you're finding them valuable and that um, you'll suggest future topics and keep on coming and uh, help us build this great, uh, this great collaboratory. So I, I want to uh, hand it off to uh, Linda Planton Yu, uh, who will be introducing our presenter for today. Thank you so much, Richard. And I have the great honor to present Dr. Francis Smith for this webinar. And Fran is an educator and consultant based in Richmond, Virginia in the USA. She has taught as an adjunct professor in the Graduate School of Education and Human Development at George Washington University since the late 80s. And her topic is voc uh, vocation evaluation topic areas. In 2003, she began piloting a new graduate hybrid course in universal design for learning. And the course has been given during the past 18 years as a face-to-face -face and blended learning, and now it's on completely online. And Dr. Smith holds an MA in Collaborative Vocation Evaluation and EDS in Transition Special Education and EDD in Higher Education Administration, and all from George Washington University. And I find it very interesting that Fran in 2011 was selected as one of the eight postdoctoral UDL fellows in residence at CAST and Boston College Lynch School of Education. And her focus on UDL in higher education, transition, transition special education, career assessment and inclusive technologies. And Dr. Smith is currently a member of the CAST National Faculty. She has been an early adopter of UDL and provided training nationally, nationally and internationally. She is a past board member of the former National UDL Task Force in the USA and represented the voice of the vocal evaluation and career assessment professional assessment. And I know for you that has arrived now, I know that Fran would love you to type in your location in the chat, so please feel free to do so. And this webinar today, she will highlight of how a graduate course in universal design for learning has evolved <coughs> over 18 years, and she will focus on strengths, opportunities, and lessons learned among those years. And it's a really big honor for us at the Include Collaboratory to invite you, Fran, for this webinar. And I know that the audience can't wait to hear more from you and for me to stop talking. So the floor is yours, Fran. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you to all that are on today. Um, I typically... Uh, in it with a smaller group would have a lot more opportunity for some uh, engagement, but given our short time and the numbers that I understand are going to be on the, the call, we're going to try to, I think, go through the presentation and keep some questions to the end. Is that correct, Linda? For today, good. So uh, I, I'm uh, thrilled to be able to share with you some uh, highlights of the journey I've had in teaching this course and uh, and delighted to, to be able to talk about this. Um, many individuals have been a part of making this all a success, including the time I spent with CAST and Boston College and uh, Dr. Jackson and Dr. Hall, who's on the call from CAST, had a, a major opportunity to strengthen some of the things that I've done in this course um, over the years. But my information is on this slide. Um, there's a link to my website if you want to 
dig deeper into some things that I've done over the years um, and articles that I've published. Um, but we're going to focus on um, the course at GW University primarily today and take you through that uh, in the next few slides. So let me move forward. Oh, and this is why we <laughs> wish that we didn't have uh, Google Slides sometimes because we do run into these challenges. So apologize for just a moment while we get that back on. Um, I am running um, live captioning, which is a feature in, um, in Google Slides, and it allows me to have that running across the screen. I do this in my courses. Um, it gives the opportunity to have that um, support in place. Um, I've found that, you know, I know that we're doing that uh, through, I think, Zoom today, but um, I think it's a great uh, technology innovation that we have had available to us um, to use. And um, so you'll see my, you should see, let me get that running again real quickly. You should see that showing up at the bottom of the screen. Okay. So um, as uh, Linda mentioned, um, I've, I've taught as an adjunct professor with George Washington uh, for quite a while. I started working with their uh, vocational evaluation coursework, which was where I had my, my first degree from there and continued on when we started developing this course. Um, I was with uh, the UDL postdoctoral fellowship in in Boston, and since I've been back in Richmond, I've been working as a consultant, and I have had the great opportunity to join CAST UDL National Faculty and do some training with them as well. So um, what we're going to cover today, the main goals that I want to address are to identify some of the strategies that were used in the development of this course on UDL, to consider strategies, technologies, and techniques used in the delivery of this course and look at that over time and explore tools and approaches that have been applied in successful ways to improve this course and engage student learning. And at the end of the presentation, I'll introduce you to some of my students through some of their comments and where they have, have gone forward. Um, I was actually working with Virginia Commonwealth University when I began um, this course as an adjunct with GW, and I would take uh, time and go up there in the summer, take uh, leave time and go up in the summer to do a one-week institute, and the remainder of the course was taught um, online. So we did that as early as 2003, um, and I'll talk a little bit about even some of the things that happened when I was at Virginia Commonwealth University with UDL efforts there as well. Um, as I mentioned, I was a UDL fellow. And while I was a fellow, I had the great honor of working with Dr. Jackson and Dr. Hall from CAST with Boston College's course on uh, universal design for learning in a, a leadership um, symposium that we had. And that was also a, a very valuable experience. And I've also worked a lot with um, Educause Learning Initiative, which is a uh, part of an organization known as Educause in the US. I think they uh, have international representation and they often have audiences of faculty that are working with um, innovative technology and learning technologies and teaching. So I've, I have been to many of their conferences and over the years, I think that might've happened in 2014. My memory's not exact on those dates. There's an article uh, that was published by the cast uh, folks on seven things you need to know about universal design for learning. So that's in their library as well. So for me, um, the first steps of this course development happened when I was um, probably more in a practitioner role. I was working as an adjunct. Um, I had not gotten my doctorate at that time. I had a lot of experience in vocational evaluation with individuals with disabilities. 
And I also have been an assistive technology practitioner with a uh, public school system in the Metro Washington DC area. And I was a very early adopter of technology. And I think for those of you who've done that and used those tools for years, that is a great um, platform to launch off of into something like this. Um, in the middle of the course, I was uh, I had started working on my doctorate and I was involved in a lot of uh, work and research and projects that um, helped to enrich this course because this became a part of that as well. And then ongoing steps that have continued in this course um, have, I think, followed the field of universal design for learning. And we've really tried to structure uh, course tasks and assignments that make sure that students come out of the course with an, a perspective of appreciating their own growth as expert learners in UDL. So I'm going to start with some points um, from a variety of, of fields for you to think about as I, as I start this talk. Um, one of the things that happened in the United States in 2008 which I think was pretty significant for those of us in higher education around universal design for learning was the um, author authorization of the Higher Education Opportunity Act of 2008. It was the first time we saw the, the language that you see here that defines universal design for learning in a way that complements what we teach around multiple options and how information is represented how students get engaged with that information and how they act and express their knowledge. And there's other language in this um, act that was significant for what we were doing. And I think many faculty around the country on making sure that teacher education students and, and students going through education programs were learning these principles um, for, their, for their work. As I mentioned, I have uh, made sure that um, I've stayed close to uh, technology trends that come out of the Educause uh, organization because I think they are really on the curve of what's happening. Now, this was a report that came out in 2015 and it was um, right on target with what they were forecasting of changes to learning management systems, which many of us use in, um, in higher education, such as Blackboard, which is the program that we used at George Washington. I know, um, I think Boston College, Richard, are using Canvas, as I think uh, Virginia Commonwealth University is, and a number of schools have gone to that as well. But I think it's important to, to look at the trends and see where we are today, because as this article notes, um, many, of these, many of these programs will have embedded features to personalize, focus on learning, and embed accessibility functionality. And I can tell you at George Washington University now, we have um, a number of either add-on tools that the university is including in Blackboard that make that um, functionality to make sure that that materials are more accessible um, already in place for faculty to use, and they're much easier for them to, um, to use as well. Now, I followed also the Horizon Report, which is an annual report that comes out again from the Educause folks on trends in technology. And I don't, technology is not necessarily the requirement of universal design for learning, but we've always wanted to emphasize the flexibility technology provides in offering that kind of a, a flexible platform to build on. So these are the trends for 2021 in just technology. But note, note um, under the second bullet here, increased use of learning technologies and some of the examples there. Some of us have been using those for many years, but they have been on on target with emphasizing the, the nature of what we'll see coming forward. I'm not surprised with the adoption of 
hybrid learning models. Um, those have been around for a while or online faculty development, given the type of um, changes we all went through last year with, with the pandemic um, going on. An article from 2009 that re-emphasizes the importance of adult learning principles. And again, I've highlighted in yellow some of the things that I think uh, also parallel what we talk about when we emphasize universal design for learning. Adults need to know why they're learning. They need to know um, the need, they're motivated by the need to solve problems. Their previous experiences must be respected and built upon. They need learning approaches that match their background and diversity. Um, I think Betsy, in the interest of time, I'm going to, oh, I was afraid that would happen. Apologize for the technology. Um, pieces here. Um, can I help in some way or? No, nope, you... nope. just, just okay. uh, we'll just keep going. Um, this, this is what happens when we're using a live, live tool, but I think it Absolutely. makes it much more flexible. So um, there is a video here you can go back and um, take a look at. I'm going to pass over this right now. But this is an, a video that also came out in 2017 from Educause. It's a lot about technology here, but there's a big point at the end of this video that emphasizes uh, students of the future will capitalize on universal design. They don't talk about universal design for learning per se, but the importance of universal design functionality built in for students with disabilities, which actually we know universal design, like universal design for learning, built in from the beginning, um, uh, considers all learners and um, especially those um, at the margins. So let me walk you through some of my first steps with this course. I think I, I noted in the blog uh, post that I wrote that um, when I was invited to come to CAS for a summer institute, in 2001 to learn about UDL. This had not been published in this book from CAST, but this article had been published um, in a different uh, version by David Rose and Ann Meyer that were the original founders of CAST and the whole thinking around UDL. But I thought this was um, just a wonderful, uh, very strong comment that they were writing about the fact that especially in the second piece, that students will know their own strengths and weaknesses, know the kinds of media adaptation strategies and external technologies they can use to overcome their weaknesses and extend their strengths. And he notes that we'll graduate students who are expert learners. So that was written originally in 2000. And I think we see a lot of that happening right now, which is, a real exciting thing to be a part of because that technology has caught up. And in some cases, that technology has caught up with product development. And we still have many um, educators that are still learning about this, but uh, it's a very magical world that we're in. I hope you can see this um, on your end. I tried to uh, put together a timeline, kind of looking at some of the developments that were happening when I started teaching this course in the US um, and some of the things that were happening at CAST and some of the things that were happening in policy in the US that impacted what we were doing. Um, as you can see back in 2003, and I noted that the Summer Institute I attended in 2001 followed underneath that, the importance of web accessibility was growing around the country. The, um, the federal legislation at the time in our, our country was the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, where universal design for learning was noted. And the NIMAS standard, which was a significant um, national standard on making uh, text uh, accessible for individuals with disabilities was also in that publication or in that uh, policy. 
all had an impact on what we were trying to do in the course. So we had, I had an emphasis in the course as a project for students to look at the accessibility of websites. Um, and we were looking at UDL in curriculum. We were looking at um, the Universal Design for Learning three core principles on, on the options needed for that. Teaching Every Student in the Digital Age was the first text released by CAST and that came out in 2002. And in 2006, I was very fortunate to add a, a colleague that I was working with um, at Virginia Commonwealth University, Dr. Suzanne Crosdale, as a co-instructor who brought a rich background in curriculum instruction. Fast forward to 2008, the universal, uh, the uh, UDL was defined in the Higher Ed Act of 2008. CAST issued the first guide, uh, UDL guidelines. Um, the National Center on UDL was established and UDL was defined in our national technology plan. In um, 2012 era, we had um, another publication come out in 2014 from CAS, UDL Theory and Practice. UDL continued to be defined in other policies, the um, Every Student Succeeds Act in the US, the National Tech Plan of 2016, and it was strengthened in language in 2018 in the Career Technology um, uh, Education Act. So um, those were important developments then. And now in, in the years 2019 forward, um, we've had the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials evolving. We've seen more research, which has been going on since their inception from CAST on innovation and uh, research and innovation grants that have fueled a ton of wonderful um, web-based open resources. They've been there and responsive to remote learning, and they're now working on another iteration of the guidelines around UDL rising to equity. So all of those have flavored what I've tried to do and we've tried to do in this course. So when we began the course, um, the idea came out of uh, work with a faculty I was working with in the Vocational Evaluation and Career Assessment Program. And we started out, as I mentioned in the blog, with a week-long summer institute in Washington, D.C. Um, we had students coming from all over the country. Um, and we, uh, we offered, from that first iteration, we offered uh, a couple of weeks after the course to provide online um, support through Blackboard, which was in place then, but a very early version of that. Um, the course, when it went further into becoming actually a course listing. It was always a cross-listed course. It originated from the um, Department of Special Ed and Disability um, Policy or Studies rather. And it was cross-listed with um, a curriculum program at the graduate school. And since 2013, it has been completely online. And I think that's been a trend for a lot of uh, programs around the country. Um, we have used a lot of publications that CAST has brought to the field, which have been invaluable over the years. And those are a couple of those are, are shown there in the, the bottom image. As I mentioned in the grant, um, the, the project at George Washington University got some real legs, if you will, through a grant that was being offered through the Disability Services Office, which was in partnership with Ohio State University. It was from their Faculty Administrative Modules in Higher Education project. And um, so I applied for one of those. Um, it was a, a small seed grant to enhance the course. Um, for me, I use that to expand the Blackboard course that we had online. Um, it was an area that I had done a lot of work in, and I felt that was a space that I could, could really, um, really support. So I know this is not easy to see, this small little picture, but this is actually from a, a publication 
newsletter that came out in 2005 at GW University. The link to the online piece is there for you. Um, I modeled, when we first started this course, we modeled it after the uh, Summer Institute, the CAST had provided, and um, there were no texts at that time. So we tried to follow their um, great teachings with what we were covering. When we got those initial grants that I just mentioned, um, I was joined by these two faculty who were at GW. I'm sure if you search the literature, you can find some of the publications that they authored on what they did with universal design and universal design for learning. Um, this course has been required by two master's programs at GW for a number of years. It's also a listed elective for doctorate in special education. And I'll emphasize this again, but um, the infusion of best practices of UDL have been um, continued and we've partnered at the university with uh, the Disability Support Services Office, the Online Learning Office through the Provost, and also the Faculty Academic Technology Office. And I think you see um, oftentimes Universal Design for Learning bubbling up out of especially disability support as well as um, faculty academic technology around the country. So when we were um, first starting this course- Excuse me, Fran, I just want you to know uh, yeah. we're no longer able to see the um, live transcription. I oh. think people can activate live transcription through Zoom on their own end, which Sorry I, about that. that's okay. So when we started this um, course, uh, we were beginning with what was, what was in the field. And um, again, as, as I mentioned on that timeline, the guidelines uh, were not in place and um, I'm sorry, Betsy, this is uh, not the technology challenges I expected to have with what we're doing. Um, but we were using um, the principles of um, universal design for learning because that was pretty much where we all were with um, thinking about UDL. And uh, the focus was on those three core principles of um, considering multiple means of representation, multiple means for engagement, and multiple means for action expression. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, web accessibility was very big in the U.S. at the time and around the country that was evolving, so we were building that into um, our design, um, and we were trying to model that through what we were building in Blackboard and what we were using in the course. Um, this is one of the flyers of many that we were sending out uh, advertising the course uh, as, again, emphasizing um, core pieces of what we do with Universal Design for Learning, um, a comprehensive review of, of the big picture, the importance of using a UDL lens around designing curriculum and lessons, uh, a focus on the importance of developing clear goals, and um, thinking about as we wanted them to finish the program with a action plan or a beginning systems change, change plan around how they were gonna build UDL into their, their work. So Universal Design for Learning guidelines started to evolve and um, the early uh, iteration of those were focused as you see on the left with the uh, uh, principles on representation coming up first, then action expression, and then engagement. And of course, now we're using um, a different model, which is more representative of the research on the importance of engagement first, then representation and action expression. And in 2018, again, thanks to CAST, we have an entire website on the UDL guidelines that um, has been a wonderful tool for students to access because there are multiple formats of the guidelines, multiple um, 
links to have them be able to dig deeply into all of these um, principles and guidelines and checkpoints and better understand the research behind that. And there are also translations of the guidelines in different languages. So this has been a really rich resource that we've been able to, to utilize in the course. And the ongoing um, changes in the field, we have uh, continued to emphasize like most the, the, what the research has, has taught us about variability across learners and planning for that variability and how different that is in context and how different learners are in their background experiences and preferences. And I've embedded some videos that you can dig deeper into all of these topics on the slides, but in the interest of time, I'm continuing forward. As I mentioned, we have, um, uh, from the beginning of the course, uh, used this, uh, teaching students to use this guidelines lens as they think about curriculum. And we spend time on all of these areas um, in the course, uh, entire weeks on developing clear goals, removing barriers, designing with flexible methods, uh, using flexible options, and working with multiple formative assessments, and many other things. But those are central to the, the course design. Um, so expert learning is um, a big part of the guideline structure, and I I think it's uh, iterated in the, the research on how people learn. It's been reiterated in the text that CAST has brought forward. And you'll see in the comments I have from some of the students that have taken the class, it's great to see how this evolves as they go through 15 weeks and come to the end of the class and, and see how the design has supported that process. So I'm gonna walk you through um, the syllabus and some course elements and the course design in the, show you how we've done this. So I was an early adopter of technology, as I mentioned. The first course I taught online um, at GW was in 1997 in technology and disability. So I purposely put this syllabus here to show you, uh, I think most of us have over the years had a very, um, very uh, text heavy syllabus that we use. And one of the things about UDL that I've tried to build into my syllabus is adding um, some different ways to represent information. You can see the change of that on the right hand side with a format, adding images, adding uh, different color, adding highlights. Um, I've used tables to uh, compare objectives to assignments and a lot of other ways to do that. I also went to, and there's a resource you'll see later in this presentation. This was an earlier um, resource from my colleagues in California, um, a syllabus rubric that I've used, I've taught others to use that came from um, the UDL universe um, dot com. I think they've uh, changed that resource several times, but um, a great uh, way to think about a traditional syllabus and a, a UDL syllabus and how we can enrich that uh, to make that more accessible, make that more UDL friendly. So the course text that we've used in this course um, the core course text around UDL, the first one we began with, which came out in 2002, was this one, Teaching Every Student in the Digital Age. I've always uh, appreciated CAST uh, modeling the message that they teach about UDL. This was online, and you can see in the examples here, the digital copy on the right. Each of the chapters separated, linked, so that students could e easily go into those uh, chapters separately. And on the left, a picture of what that chapter would look like, where the um, key points are highlighted, where there's a multiple representations with a concept map, where there are videos, where there are images, 
and links to dig deeper into the information. So again, they model, model what they are teaching and what they're designing. And then in 2014, the Universal Design for Learning Theory and Practice text uh, was, uh, came out and again, an open format online that's freely available, which I try to use uh, as much as I can, text in my course that are both print, print available and either an EPUB or an online um, uh, text. So uh, you can go in and link to this, um, set up a login for yourself and you've got access to a rich body of knowledge. In the course design, um, we kind of, again, modeling those three areas, multiple options to support engagement, multiple options to support um, representation, and multiple options to support action expression. So in multiple options for engagement, um, and I've uh, borrowed a great uh, example of this through the guidelines. Um, some of the things that we've done over time, um, I always send out a, a pre-survey to students to get an idea of uh, their background experiences, their interests, their goals, and any issues that um, I need to know about. If I have um, the opportunity, I try to do individual synchronous Zoom meet and greets, but um, if it's uh, not something I can do because of the size of the course, I'll do that the first night and we'll have a, we always have a several um, synchronous meetings live. Um, and, and I'm talking about the online version of the course. Um, in the course language, I've always um, highlighted optional means for how students can both um, share their knowledge and uh, complete assignments in the syllabus. The goals are the same. Uh, they're still very rigorous. There's still a need for them to submit work that's in a graduate, uh, at a graduate level and cited to the research, um, but there are optional ways to do that. I've invited UDL guests to my class over the years and online as well as when we were doing the week-long institute and being in the Washington DC area, we were able to pull in some of the national leaders at um, a number of associations uh, to come and talk to students. These are a couple of pictures from some of our face-to-face um, -face summer institutes. Um, sadly, sometimes when you ask for a classroom at a university, uh, that is on universal design for learning, the automatic assumption is we'll give you a room full of uh, computers at, uh, at desk. And sometimes those are not as flexible for uh, developing um, spaces for students to work in groups, which is always good for dialogue and, and lots of, of activities. But um, that's what we were doing in the top left. On the top right, we uh, had other classrooms where we were able to to let students make meaning of, of learning. And you'll see post-it notes on the walls and other slides. When we were in uh, Washington, DC, we happened to be next door to a Whole Foods grocery. And we used that opportunity for students when they went to get lunch to think about um, what they were learning the first couple of days about universal design and universal design for learning. And they'd come back after that hour with lots of stories to share about what they were seeing because their awareness had been peaked about um, what was and what wasn't in those environments. And then the elevator on the right, we were using this uh, approach and a lot of trainers use um, about an elevator speech and crafting that idea in a minute or, or five minutes, however long the elevator took um, to share with a colleague about what they were learning at the end of the week about UDL. And some of the tools that we've used over time, um, both in the uh, current completely online course and as we used it as a hybrid support, Blackboard has had a tool called <clears throat> Blackboard Collaborate, which is um, great, quite a bit like Zoom, but Zoom I think is a much more flexible platform. 
um, voice thread, which is down in the bottom left corner I've used with students, which is a great collaborative tool to allow them to um, discuss uh, a website, an article, or a number of things in an online space where they can use, again, multiple ways to show their knowledge. I use WordPress and have used that over the years for reflective blogging with my students. And I've also used Wordle, and now I can use Answer Garden and a lot of other tools that allow you to build uh, word clouds for emphasis on uh, meaning of information and text. Multiple options of representation. Um, I have uh, always tried to build from the beginning an accessible foundation with the course materials that are digital. Um, I've found over the years, it's been um, exciting to watch as some of the trends have forecast. When we first started teaching, um, all of the accessibility was often coordinated through the Disability Support Students Office. And I think that still happens with um, students that need that. But increasingly, students have become very um, comfortable with technology. And those that need accessibility have already mastered the tool. So they come in um, using those and often are teaching students how to use those. And there's, there's very little challenge for them because we're using a digital platform that they can just easily um, adjust to. This is an example of my online course. Um, I've structured it intentionally in ways um, using the Blackboard sidebar um, that kind of keep topics together. Um, this looks a little different when it's in full, uh, full use. Um, weekly sessions are released um, each week, so those populate underneath that category. Um, I include areas um, intentionally to start, and some of these things don't appear until the first week. Some of them start even earlier. Um, and again, I uh, build in ways and resources to support prior knowledge, to enhance um, features of the course to support comprehension. And I've used a variety of uh, resources over the years for um, supporting students. This is a, a, a kind of a, a snapshot, if you will, on the right of kind of what we're doing during the week, and then a graphic organizer kind of illustrating key points that we're covering uh, either through the course or during the week. I've also used um, blogging as a resource for students to show and kind of chronicle their learning um, throughout the course. So <clears throat> I've gotten a lot of positive um, responses from students about this because it gives them a chance to learn as they go and to have a chance to individualize their blogs based on how they like those to be represented. And um, as I was showing earlier, um, and, and we teach students how to utilize some of the tools that are in so many mainstream technologies today. Um, PowerPoint, Google Slides, uh, offer a free fe feature of live captioning. Um, I know we use that through the Disability Support Office and there are ways to do that in Zoom as well. So again, the technology has, has moved along in a way that we're able to, to leverage that today. Multiple options for action expression. Um, again, I, I emphasize this in the syllabus and have since we began with multiple ways for students to complete projects. Um, we use ongoing formative checkpoints to clarify understanding, uh, lots of um, comments and feedback in, in re, uh, materials that are submitted. I use the announcements in Blackboard throughout the course to often keep um, providing uh, information on checkpoints about what's happening in the course. Um, I provide models of what projects look like so students can get an idea of what, what others have done and what we're looking for. Um, use rubrics for all the as, as assignments and uh, model 
and promote the use of assistive technologies in the course. Um, and I think uh, uh, this is, uh, there's an article at the bottom that uh, David Rose and colleagues at CAST in 2006 published based on the course that he has taught since its inception on UDL and um, how he started very early asking for volunteers to capture notes in class, which was just a brilliant idea. And it certainly <clears throat> has spurred that um, for many of us. And I uh, started modeling this assistive uh, tool, the live scribe pen very early in my class and um, found as universities started adopting this in uh, bookstores, students started bringing that into class and using it um, for capturing notes. So again, uh, keeping that uh, perspective open for, for welcoming students. This is an example of, again, some things that we did in class on the left-hand side, very early uh, taking the guidelines again and cutting them into kind of a, a puzzle and having students to come in each day to remember where these are aligned in the guidelines as we were uh, uh, learning about that. It's a big concept for people to understand and to start to um, appreciate. Um, gallery walks that we would do around the classroom of, of what students were learning, as you can see here, um, applying the UDL lens to goals, materials, methods, and assessments. Uh, again, when, I, when we open the door for students to show their knowledge in different ways for their final projects, this was one done back in, I think, 2009 when PB Works was a very popular wiki tool. And this student was a uh, amazing designer and built a uh, website for her final project that was uh, far exceeded anything she could have done in a paper. All the references were there, all the literature was cited, um, and a very engaging um, product. So inclusive and universal designs often spur innovative thinking. And these are some uh, quotes from students that have had, um, and you can get an idea of some of the things that they were talking about. I love this, the quote on the left, where UDL is much more than just in the classroom and um, how this student's uh, work did that on the right. Uh, another example of how a student I had um, recognized by the end of the class, which was good, um, how the whole process was building her own expertise. Um, but it's been very positive. I've had students uh, in, from all over the world who've taken this class and gone back to countries to uh, make changes. These are some of the comments again. Where are those students today? Um, some have be moved into positions. You've probably seen their names. I'm not going to mention them here, but national leaders, um, people that have authored some of the books that we've uh, had in our courses, change agents that have uh, taken UDL to the local, regional, state, and international level. Um, uh, we've had museum educators that have taken UDL into museum education. I had one student working with the Smithsonian's who was going to take her project there. Um, educators and faculty who've taken what they've learned when we started this very early. Um, faculty were coming into the class and sitting in and they've taken that into their uh, courses and uh, redesigned them. Um, technology staff and technology leaders who've taken UDL by taking this course or sitting in and then redesigned um, protocols that they're using. And lessons learned, um, you know, I was an early adopter. Uh, when I came back from the CAST Institute, I was on fire about UDL. And I think that's happened to many of us, but it was very early and um, there was not a lot of research that had been published and that's important. Um, and there was pushback. Um, the technology we used in the early days was um, not as flexible as, as it is today. And there were barriers to uh, making things happen in classrooms for students who came in who had 
um, disabilities, um, but, but that again has, has changed over time. Exploring partnerships, um, as I mentioned, the ones we've done uh, are invaluable, especially in higher education, for expanding opportunities for building UDL. Using a UDL lens to guide best practice um, is important uh, to spur and model best practice, and I think that that has happened in all the students that we've worked with. Following trends in technology, um, is very important because I think that's um, driving innovation and um, emphasizing the importance of, of building expert learners um, has been really important for graduate students um, because in even using the blogging we use for reflective practice, it, it just, it's, it's wonderful to watch the process. It's, it takes a lot of work, um, but I think good learning is, is a part of that. I've listed some resources here that have been key to um, things that I've used. Uh, the two top ones are from CAST, the third one's from, from CAST and from work from a variety of, of places that um, work that Richard's been involved with. But you'll see some examples of colleges around the, especially around the US that have um, grown their UDL work. Um, and some of the resources that I mentioned. Apologize for the technology snafus, but um, I'm sure you can appreciate this happening on your end and I'm happy to, to answer questions if I can here today. I'm gonna stop the sharing, is that okay, Linda? Absolutely, and thank you so much, Fran, for a fantastic presentation of your work. Okay. I know I can talk for, for the rest of us when I say that this was very inspiring and very interesting. And I know that a lot of us can have a lot of to think about how we arrange our student courses. So thank you so much. Good. And um, we have a couple of questions. We have like a couple of minutes left and we have a couple of questions. So I wonder, Fran, if it's okay if we take some of those? Yes. Thank you. We have a question about the UDL course being fully online now. And um, how does this differ from the face-to-face -face, um, experience you have in early years? Um, I don't know why my video is not showing, but... Um... <laughs> Um, I think that, you know, I, I've tried to, um, uh, utilize, um, definitely, uh, the, the value of tools like Zoom. Um, so I think what you lose when you go online sometimes and what people are concerned about is that you don't have that, um, face-to-face -face interaction and certainly having people together in a room, the energy we have as a group and the ability to um, work side by side or, or with individuals where you're working through material is something that we've missed. Um, you can certainly try to simulate that with a lot of the tools that are out there today. And we try to do that as best we can. I know students have really appreciated my bringing in virtual guests. Mm -hmm. uh, and using Zoom to post my own videos of summaries of the course, uh, of the lectures each, each excuse me, each week, um, those types of things. I record each week and I post it just like you're doing um, and the captioning usually works. So I've got all of that built in as well. Thank you. And if you wish for the future, would you like to still have it only completely online, or would you? Uh, could you see? Um, could you see benefits of having it as blended learnings? I I think the research has supported this too. Yes, I think blended is a is a very positive model, and if we could provide this um, again in that format, that would be that would be a preference. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure if we'll see that happening, um, but uh, I've even 
I've heard that from students. It's a lot of information um, that they really appreciate and wish that they had that face-to-face -face opportunity. Thank you so much for that answer. I have another question. Sure. Um, that is some examples of the add-ons in the BB would be interesting to see if we are missing some tricks. Uh, yeah. The, the add-on that we have used recently is, um, and I don't know, Richard, if you want to interject, we're using a Blackboard Ally, uh, which is a add-on added for making sure that uh, images are uh, have an alt text built in. So that if an individual is a screen reader and blind, that they can hear or understand what that represents. So that's a big challenge for um, putting information online that uh, has been going on for years. Uh, yes, things... Fran, Canvas has a similar function uh, yeah. to the Blackboard Ally and our, our um our support, our Canvas support system at Dawson College uh, screens for accessibility and alerts instructors for when, when there are challenge, potential challenges. One of the, one of the things, the Canvas is so flexible, so is Blackboard, yeah. that uh, professors can selectively use um, features that ensure accessibility after they've learned something about the composition of their classes. Yeah, probably you saw in the Blackboard example I gave, I have, have changed the buttons on the left-hand side and rearranged those. And those are just features that you just have to dig deeper into for that type of support. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to say also, here is one um, listener that say that she's really appreciating the use of graphic organizers throughout your course and throughout your preparation and materials. And I think we are a lot of people that can um, stay right into that comment that we think it's a very nice way of developing a course. Thank you. I, you know, Microsoft Word, which I use um, as a, a product, has a great tool called Smart Art, and that's how I usually will build um, those types of things. But when we first started out with the course, we used uh, Inspiration, which was a product on the market for graphic designing, and we were able to get the company to allow us to have a free 30-day license or for the length of the course for students to use it. And again, because I opened the door early in my syllabus to let them show their knowledge in different ways, the graphic organizer designs of a project or a paper or the key points of a, um, a project they were developing were phenomenal for those that needed to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Really beautiful in, in your course, Fran, mm. how Thank you're modeling UDL you. uh, for your students. And I think that that becomes really uh, a critical piece that they can mm. see in real time that you're using it in the ways you're using it. So uh, that really comes through. Thanks so much. Mm. Thank, really you. Thank, Thank you. does. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if there are some more questions. I, I can't find any more in the chat, but if there are some questions, please feel free to open your, unmute yourself and uh, speak out. Well, <laughs> Fran, I just wanted to, want to tell you, I'm just completely blown away by your the comprehensiveness of your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank I, you. was, I was expecting uh, a how you teach your course, but what I got was just uh, 10 years of abundant resources that you collected. And I'm, I'm thrilled to see, I'm actually following the, the emergence of your leadership and how you really fulfilled the promise of, of the postdoc UDL fellows program. This is a, thank you for putting all this together and sharing it with us. Uh, I think we are going to get a PDF of the PowerPoint because there's so much information in here. 
Yes, I uh, I sent that to uh, Betsy this morning, um, and I okay. tried to make sure the images were accessible in uh, PowerPoint before we did the conversion. So um, hopefully that's all in play. Fantastic, Fran. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Jackson. All, yeah, <laughs> it, it, what a beautiful Thank you, Dr. presentation. Smith. <laughs> and it's really, um, you know, I, I learned, uh, you know, quite a bit in terms of just the way that you've organized uh, the course in terms of presenting the various concepts. So I really appreciate that. For our listeners, um, these, uh, the recording of this session, as well as the PDF of Fran's slides will be available on the Include website um, uh, in a, a short period of time. Uh, you know, I think we'll uh, we'll take a look, see if some of the uh, time in the beginning, um, you know, might be edited out, um, and then just start with your presentation. But Fran, thank you so much for uh, being you. part of being part of our include webinar series. My pleasure. And if you want to read any articles, um, there's more under the website that I listed. You can can dig deeper there. Great Thanks to be so here. Much. Have a great day. Take care now. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks, Richard. And thank you all for thank attending. You. Have a great thank day. You. Bye. Same to you. Bye. Bye.